know, I used to, uh, at the very beginning of my uh, self-discovery, um, recommended by a therapist in Los Angeles, started attending 12-step meetings. I have, uh, uh, you know, I've attended uh, some uh, Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. Uh, she told me, just go to any meeting, it does not matter. It's about uh, people uh, exploring themselves, revealing themselves without feedback in, in that safe atmosphere. And I, I really liked the concept. And I eventually settled in a group called uh, Codependence Anonymous. Uh, you know, I attended the meetings for a couple of years and I grew quite a bit during that period. I fondly remember those times uh, making some of the friends I made who are still friends today. So I'm so glad to be able to uh, present uh, to a 12-step you know, umbrella group. I'm so glad. Um, and I wrote that to Patrick. Yeah. So, um, so my name is Raja Selvam. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist in California. And uh, I have been um, involved uh, in teaching a couple of training programs one is the work of Dr. Peter Levine, uh, the approach called somatic experiencing or SE. It, it focuses on working with trauma uh, through the body. One of the things that um, scientists have discovered over time is that um, in people, uh, especially uh, veterans, war veterans with PTSD, um, in the brain, they find that the information about the body gets to the brain, but does not go to the radius of the brain where one makes decisions. So it's as though the body is delinked uh, from the decision-making process when it comes to veterans with PTSD as opposed to veterans without PTSD. Therefore, the idea came up in the 90s that it's very important to include the body you know, uh, in, in, in treating trauma. Yeah. Now, what has become uh, possible now with all the science that we have uh, uh, you know, all the science that has been developed since is the following, and I will I will try to uh, uh, you know uh, you know explain it in a, a series of simple statements uh, that cognition, which means everything from um, everything from awareness, awareness and attention the five sense perception, how we perceive the world through the five senses, evaluation, how we make, make sense of the data, our memory, our ability to language. These are the different aspects of cognition. Cognition does not mean only thinking or evaluation. It means all of these things. And emotion. Emotion can be defined broadly. Emotion, feeling, affect, mood, motivation, all of those things can be described broadly uh, in science as emotion. And behavior, what we do, what we don't do, including behavior, compulsive behaviors, uh, 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 you know, e expression, verbal expression, nonverbal expression. What do we do with the body? What we don't do, do with the body? So the three aspects of experience that psychologists study or work with in one modality or the other, cognition, emotion, behavior, the three of them, we were taught when we were in graduate school, they, build, they depended on one's brain only, not so much on the body. Now there is convincing scientific evidence, not everybody knows it. Therefore, there's an exciting opportunity to bring this knowledge to the world that what we, our cognition, emotion, and behavior in every moment depends not just on the brain, but also on the body and the environment. 
this was this not very well known. When people think of cognition, they think of neurons in the brain only. When they think of emotion, the same thing, or behavior, the same thing. The focus has always been on the brain, not on the body. The body is neglected. Yeah. But now we're learning it not only depends on the body, but it also depends on the environment. Now, I'll give you a simple example. And with that example, you will see, of course, this is true. Why didn't science, why did not science know that? That's how it is. You know, science progresses very slowly, you know, uh, and, and the, it, it makes the, it takes time to reach conclusions that, that, that are so obvious to many other people. Yeah, that have been obvious to us right from the beginning. So, for example, if you think of the bonding experience of a child, a young baby, what does it depend on? Does it only depend on the brain of the child? No. It depends on the body of the child, how it experiences the surroundings, the mother, caregivers, correct? That's obvious. But it does not only depend on the the, the, the body of the child. It also depends on the body of the parents, you know, the mother, the father, the grandparents, the environment, does it not? But not only does it not depend on the human environment, but also depends on what? The non-human environment. I'm sure that the child growing up in a poor, violent, uh, you know, unsafe neighborhood of town is going to have a very different bonding experience because what's happening in the environment is also affecting the human environment, the adult environment. That in turn affects the child. So it's obvious that cognition, emotion, behavior depend on not just the brain, but also the body and the, and the, um, the environment. This, this is significant. This is significant. What it tells us then is that any modality, healing modality, whether it is um, a formal modality such as psychotherapy or you know more less formal modalities such as self-help programs, can do much better. Can do much better if they also find a way to include the work with the body in their approach. Yeah, that is the that is the conclusion that we have. If we don't include the body in our approach, you know, we are working with behavior, you know, we are working with behavior, we're working with meanings, right? We are working with behavior, often compuls compulsive behavior. We're trying to establish new behaviors in the place of behaviors that have been hurtful. Um, so we're trying to do all those things. We're trying to change the way we feel in the world, yeah, emotions. So what the new science of embodiment, I would call it the new science of embodiment, show, says is that if you can include the body, in, it doesn't matter how we include the body. That's something that people talk about. We have to pay attention to what is happening in the body and to get that information to the brain. If we can do that, then our outcomes are much better. Whether we're looking for recovery or we're looking for depth healing of psychological issues that go back to one's childhood. So that's the first point that I would make, yeah? Now, cognition, emotion, behavior depend on the brain, the body, and the environment. Any healing modality, any self-help effort can do better. Not that they're not doing well. Of course, they're doing well. The 400, um, psycho, uh, 400 odd psychotherapy modalities and the self help programs like Alcoholics Anonymous that have been able to treat alcoholism much better than any psychotherapy modality. Yeah. You know, we are saying can do much better if they also include in their approach some way of including the body and the environment in the, in, in the approach to healing or, or uh, recovery. Yeah, that's what I've just said, based on the science. That's the book, I've written about the science quite a bit, you know, and I will also give you links to go to read more about it, but I want to make it make this particular 
uh, presentation as practical as possible so that at the end of it, I would like you to take home at least one technique <laughs> with which you can manage your emotions. Yeah, because emotions, the inability to tolerate emotions is a prime driver of what? Um, dysfunctional cognition and behavior and emotion, the inability to tolerate emotional experiences. It also turns out that the new science in the last 24 years is also saying the following, showing conclusive evidence that at every moment, it is emotion that is driving cognition and behavior, not the other way around. You know, in the last 100 years, we started with the whole psychology that said it's behavior that matters. If you change behavior, somehow change behavior, you can change your thinking and your, and, and your feeling, right? Behaviorism. Then came cognitivism. It said, no, 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 it's meaning. If you can change meaning, you can feel change emotion and behavior. That, that is true. There's no doubt that that is true. But now we have the scientists saying it's the emotion that's driving both cognition and behavior. So in order to, the best way to manage cognition, wrong thinking, and behavior, wrong behavior, to make them more functional, is to look for the emotion and manage that emotion. And that's what we're going to be looking at as a tool and I will show you, I will, I will, I will, I will give you a quick step-by-step uh, -step protocol and perhaps you can even apply it to yourself to have an experience of it so that you can use it yourself and you know use it with your uh, people you sponsor and so on. So um, and you can also get the book and get more, more details of the methodology. Yeah. You need to find Are a way to get the information from the body to the brain. Yeah, because what happens is that uh, what I have not said so far, I will say it now, when the body shuts down, the body shuts down. For example, it constricts in an area or it inhibits the breathing. Those are some of the ways in which the body can shut down in response to difficult experience. Yeah, so when that happens, the information is not allowed to go from the body to the brain. How something is affecting us, we know through how it affects our body, right? It's not how, the body, the brain is just managing the body, right? The brain wants to know how is it affecting the loss of a loved one, affecting the body. And, the, and that emotion, that loss, abandonment, or pain or grief, there are different things, experiences possible, sadness. What we do is that we, it's unbearable, so we shut the body down by holding the breath or by constricting the breathing muscles or constricting the neck so that the information doesn't go from the body to the head and so on. There are a number of ways of doing it, a number of ways of, uh, that the body can do it. You know? Information is not available, then we are making decision just in the brain without real information on how we are being affected. Yeah. So, uh, or so we might stay in a dysfunctional relationship for a very long time because we block how it's affect the relationship is affecting our body. The information is not coming to the brain. So when I said get to the brain, I meant how do you get the information from the body to the brain? so that the brain can make better decisions. That's what I meant by it. The, the emotion we know from the science that has developed in the last 24 years is the starting point of everything. Mm -hmm. That is what I, how my awareness works, whether my awareness will pay attention to the environment will depend on my emotional state. You know, on days that I'm free, I'm uh, of emotional turmoil. I usually pay attention to the nature on the lovely walk that I go every morning. Mm -hmm. When I'm not, my awareness is on what? My awareness is on the turbulence on the inside, the problems on the inside, right? So even awareness, initial awareness is determined by emotional state. Then of course, what I pay attention to in the environment, 
and what I focus on, how I perceive those things, they're all affected by emotional, my emotional state. For example, if I'm not very happy, I'm going to be focus, perceiving and evaluating the environment in a very different way than when I'm happy. Yeah. And, and, and then, of course, the meanings I make, the memories I have, the people I feel like reaching out to, it all depends on my emotional state. Now, it doesn't mean that at any moment I can change my thinking, change my behavior, and therefore change the way I feel. But immediately, the resulting emotion starts to drive the next step in cognition and behavior, right? So the emotion is very important. It is, and it's becoming uh, very clear from the new science of uh, embodiment especially what is called embodied emotions, I will get to in a moment. This is very important. So, you know, if we want to uh, change meaning, change behavior, or not do something, not think this or that, then we need to go to the basic uh, influencer, the emotion, right? Now, and then work with it in relation to the body, but that's the next step. So, but let me define the emotion now. People are going to say, you know, this is often the case, right? People would say, I often hear people say, like for example, an alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, I've had uh, sponsors, you know, my sponsors, and, co and I've had a couple of sponsors from Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, they were, they were actually the pioneers in establishing codependence anonymous, right? It, 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 you know, the, because they had the structure, they said, they said the, they saw the benefits. There was several uh, people in AA. They they they, they would uh, in codependence anonymous. They, we would talk about emotional sobriety. Mm -hmm. You know, that's what we would talk about. What does that mean? It means to have what to be able to manage one's emotions without involving in what dysfunctional, self-destructive, uh, relational behaviors. That's what it came down to. The focus was not on addiction. Uh, the, the relational difficulties were seen as interpreted as addiction. That is compulsions that one couldn't have uh, control over because the emotions were out of control, right? So, so the, the, at the time, and this is 25, 20, 30 years ago, the understanding of emotions was that emotions are, well, you know, emotions take time to get to. People have pushed emotions away. Their families push their emotions away through drinking or something else. And, and they've also learned not to have emotions because emotions were not tended to in the family. You know, people are avoiding emotions. So our capacity for emotions, sensing them, expressing them, depend very much on the modeling that is provided at home by the caregivers. It is not there. And as we come out of an, you know, an active uh, addictive phase and we're in recovery, it's going to take time to get to emotions, right? That's what we hear. I mean, it's going to take time. So for a while, don't engage in emotional work, right? In sobriety. Don't engage in depth psychological work for at least a year because it could trigger strong emotional reactions and push the person back into addictive behavior to cope with it, right? Develop a community, support, et cetera, and strengthen your recovery and then start to explore um, your emotional life and how to manage that, you know? This is, uh, this is like a, a, a similar thinking in psychotherapy that I often question, they say, it takes uh, time to get the emotions. It takes time to develop a relationship with the therapist. And therefore, you need to, you're spending a lot of time on establishing safety and relationship first, and this could take up to a year. Then only the client will feel safe enough to start to reveal their emotions to you. This is a standard this is the standard. Now, this, I will argue, is not always true. It might be true for some people, but this is not always true. Every individual is unique. You know, and, and I will even go, every individual soul is unique. 
we might have acquired a body in this life, and this is my point of view, in this life, we might have acquired a body that might have a genetic predispos predisposition to some uh, you know, substance abuse, right? It might, it's a theory. Um, now, but however, the soul doesn't belong to just this life. You know, there's enough in scientific in, in, uh, uh, evidence for reincarnation. All that you have to do is to go to the reincarnation center in, at the University of Virginia and look at the data that they gathered of 3,000 children who spontaneously remembered their prior lives that have been verified. I don't have a memory of my prior life, but you know what? When I look at the data, I cannot say that I'm only a product of this body. This, this, this genetic structure, and I'm confined by that. When I look at the two girls across the street, the two-year-old and the five-year-old, when I look at their differences, I cannot account for the differences just on the basis of the two parents whom we know well as friends, right? There's something else going on here. So, so, so not to get off at a tangent, that, that we have, when we look at an individual, we cannot say, it takes, it's going to take a year. It's going to take a year. It can be, it's a good rule of thumb to be careful not to open up the emotional life that's too difficult in somebody who's just recovering from alcoholism or, you know, or, or who has just come into therapy, who's just starting to trust the therapist. But for my, by and large, I think the problem in that understanding is that people don't realize that we have all kinds of emotions all the time that we don't call emotions, and therefore we think we don't have emotions. I'll give an example. The, the, the research on emotions and psychology is focused on five or six emotions, happiness, sadness, anger, fear, right? H happiness, sadness, anger, fear, disgust and surprise is the first list Charles Darwin came up with. So all emotions, the list of emotions that scientists look at are a combination of these emotions. But we have emotions all the time. I'll give you an example. Because when I feel bad about something, you ask me, how are you feeling? I tell you that I'm feeling bad. Then you ask me, your therapist asks you, what do you feel? I just told you, I'm feeling bad. Feeling bad is a very basic emotion. It's because we feel bad enough that we're compelled to do something about it. If you feel so bad that she no longer picks up my calls, she has ghosted me, right? I'm talking in terms of codependence anonymous, relationship addiction, yeah? I cannot bear it. So, uh, you know, I, I, I feel bad. If I can manage the, my, the, my feeling, bad, the, fee, the emotion of feeling bad, I will not engage in the behavior. If I can tolerate that. I eat or engage in pornography because when I don't do that, I don't feel good. I feel lousy. If you treat that as an emotion and you work with it, you're right there. You can work with the emotion in a person in therapy. I tell therapists right from the first session without waiting for them to come into more refined emotions such as sadness, etc. That they don't want to come into because they're socially inhibited, but also because they feel bad. So if you can get used to feeling bad, if you can take suffering as an emotion and develop a capacity for it, you can develop a capacity for all kinds of emotions that have the underlying suffering in it. All unpleasant emotions like sadness or guilt or shame are intolerable because they feel terribly bad. You know where they feel bad? They feel bad in the body. And if you can find a way to work with the emotion of feeling bad in the body to develop a capacity for it, then what? I have control over the emotion, then I will also have control over the behavior and the cognition, like, no, I will die alone, or whatever catastrophic thinking, I'm not lovable. I'm 
worse than shit or whatever it is, the meaning that we form and then the, the compulsive behaviors we get into, right? Uh, uh, we can avoid those. And that's what I'm going to talk about how that comes about and how we can work with the emotion in the body. So I've said, said I'll, 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 because I'm not using any notes here, and sometimes it's hard to keep track of the thread. So I said, I, I've said what I've, I've said only a couple of things. I've said emotion, cognition, and behavior depend on the brain, the body, and the environment. So any approach to healing that includes all three will do much better than the one that just focuses on the brain to change the meaning. Yeah. And I then said, it's emotion that has been found to be the starting point of every thought, every perception, every behavior. And if the emotion is unmanageable, then you can imagine what? The behavior is unmanageable and the cognition thought is thinking is unmanageable. So we need to start there, right? And, and the question immediately arises, how can we find emotion so quickly? People tell us it takes months, years to develop a relationship. And I say, no, no, that's because you narrowly defined the definition of emotion. Because if you broaden the definition of emotion, then you have emotion all the time. You will find that you have emotion all the time. Right? And then, you know, you can write them. You can develop, you can bring them up, and then you can develop a capacity to tolerate them. Yeah. Which means become, they become more regulated. They are under your control so that the thinking that, and the behavior that goes in the direction of addiction can be more controlled, you know, not always successful, but more controlled than when we, when we don't. It's a longer term solution, longer term solution. Yeah. Emotion. If I see someone um, yelling at someone, I might feel bad for them. And I might make a decision. Or, or do the behavior. I make the decision yeah. in my mind cognitively, and then I do a behavior that's whether it's the right or the wrong behavior. But what is that, the thing before the emotion happens? Let me, let, you're presenting the cognitive explanation of a, that places cognition as a starting point of emotion and behavior, right? What we are learning right now in science is that cognition, emotion, and behavior cannot be separated. They arise as a simple, single impulse at the energetic level. And the physiology of cognition, emotion, and behavior cannot be separated in the brain or the body. These are the things that I write about. But what we are saying is that it's, it's true that if you have a thought that can change the way you feel, but it's not thought that arises first. It's at every moment, it's the emotion that drives cognition and behavior, every aspect of cognition and behavior. That's the paradigm shift that we're finding in science, right? So if you just track, track um, cognition, then it might appear that way. And I write about it in the book. You know, if you, start with the assumption that it's cognition that's leading to emotional change. And if you just track thinking, you will see that, that of course, there is an emotion with it. But if you look very closely, you might find that the emotion is there at the same time, not in a sequential way. Yeah, it can come in a sequential way. This is a very complex question. I, I, I write a lot about it, you know, to explain that. But it's not the, always the way it works. It's the emotion that more often drives how you end up thinking about a situation, not the other way around. Yeah. So, you know, you know, you can you can observe yourself more and see how it, whether that is true for yourself. You know. So. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. Here's another question: How do you make the emotional process conscious for people who experience severe disassociative states? Yeah. Uh, such yeah. As so emotions while disassociated. Yeah, yeah. Dissociation happens happens because they cannot tolerate the emotion. Right? 
dissociation happens because the emotion has become intolerable. So we have to find a way to regulate the body to get into the range where the emotion is more conscious. Right? So, so you know, the, the body can, when the emotion is unbearable, it can shut down in many ways. Like I said, I can just hold my breath and not feel an emotion. Right? Or I can secrete biochemicals that numb my body, that I don't sense my body, right? Then I have to work with undo. What do I have to do? I have to undo the inhibition of the breathing so that the emotion can show up. Or I have to work with the body to bring it out of dissociation and support the emotion. One way to, uh, there's a number of ways to do that. I start to support the emotion and then the dissociation comes down because I'm supporting the emotion. Or I might have to work with the body to reduce the dissociation to, and to find the emotion and support the emotion. Some of these questions will be answered as we engage in the, in, in the process in a moment. Yeah. So let me go to the next, next point. This is very important. This is the science that, that, that you know, is a core. Uh, principle in my work. What people have found, people have found, scientists in a, a finding uh, in the field called embodied emotions. You know, because you you know uh, earlier people said, how do you work with the body? You can work with it in so many different ways, right? Why can't I just exercise and make sure that the body is and the brain of communicating with each other, so that, uh, that 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 that's one way to include the body in the process, right? Yeah, true. But there are some ways that are more important, especially in relation to addiction and other things, because it's being driven by emotion, right? There are certain things that are being driven by unbearable emotion, right? So you have to you have to deal with the emotion, especially because the emotion is a starting point. If it's dysregulated so will cognition and behavior be a fun, dysfunctional. So the science of embodied emotions shows us the following. That is, that is, when the emotion is in the body, then the brain is more capable of processing it. So the more it is in the body, the more the body is involved in the emotion, the better the brain's ability to process the situation. For example, I'm being, I'm abandoned. I'm feeling extremely sad, unbearably so. I feel lonely. I feel shame. Any number of these emotions that are so unbearable that I think there's no point in living. Mm -hmm. Right? Or I have to shoot up, whatever it is. Right? So what the science says is that, listen, that feeling you have, the despair, or the emptiness that you can tolerate. Emptiness is hard. You know, sadness is easy. Emptiness from missing someone, that's hard. Right? That's an emotion. Psychologists don't look at it as emotion because they have not, they don't work with the body as much. So emptiness is not is a, is a is an emotion that's felt more keenly in the body. All emotions are, but emptiness and and not feeling good are of more body experiences that the person doesn't feel when they shut the body down. You know, and and uh, so. The, the science, new science says, if you can feel that consciously, consciously, if you can feel that emotion, emptiness, the suffering, how bad it feels in your body, in as many places in your body, right? The brain can then process the situation of abandonment much more efficiently. It can process the emotion process the car, it has enough time to think about the situation, arrive at more optimal ways of behaving in that situation. But not only that, 
as you expand the emotion in the body, it becomes more tolerable. That's one of the findings that I put forth, you know, that I, 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 I you know, in the process, you know, of expanding the emotion in the body by undoing the defenses against it, be it numbness, be it tightness, whatever it is, the more we can expand an emotion in the body, the more tolerable it becomes, which means I can stay with the emptiness longer, right? And have my brain process the situation that's causing the emptiness, the relationship that's causing the emptiness, I can bring more understanding to it. If I can do that, you can see my tone becoming calmer, right? I'm becoming more regulated as I talk about it, right? Then I'm less likely to engage in self-destructive behaviors. That is the idea. That is the idea. I'll give you an example. Now, in the morning, I breakfast and I make my own breakfast in the morning. And I have a routine. And at the end of the breakfast, I want to eat more. It's not that I'm, I'm hungry, right? And um, then I go, what is it? This is something, what is the feeling that I have? Gnawing feeling, something gnawing, you know, something emptiness I can't fill, right? I stopped. You know, I usually to eat cashew nuts that I love, you know, until I feel uncomfortable. You know, but, but at least it has filled something. It's literally filling something up. So one morning I was sitting there and thinking, I don't want to do this. I mean, this is not a big issue. You know, I'm not overweight or anything, but I feel uncomfortable. Let me explore that, right? Explore that. So I just started to notice how it uncomfortable it was. Discomfort is an emotion, right? Where is it in the body? And it was here, very often you have, one feels the most vulnerable emotions in the chest. I started to then, uh, then make some sound to capture that, like, uh, uh, because I knew that this was early. You know, I've, I've had abandonment issues, you know, abandonment traumas in my life and separation from my mother. So I would go, uh, 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 then, you know, that helped me. So I started to expand it into what? Into the throat and the facial area, which also helped me to expand it into the belly area. So now I'm sitting with this unbearable emptiness, annoying, incohate kind of experience. I've, I've, I've grasped it in my conscious awareness. Then it starts to, then I can stay with it. I don't so that impulse to reach for the cashew nuts, you know, I love cashew nuts, and was not there, was not there. Something else started to come in. So when I opened it up, when I opened, then I stayed with it. You know, I'm remembering that experience now, you know, and <clears throat> I need to do, I need to do more often, uh, more often because when I was separated from my mother in India, in many places, when children cry, what do they do? They think that the child is hungry, right? They often uh, feed the child with milk, which is very sweet. So I'm, you know, I can, I'm easily addicted to uh, sweet substances. So when I do that, then I, I also realize it feels very early. You know, like, you know, I feel like a little child, right? So I also have insight into where this might be coming from, even though I don't have a memory in terms of places and pictures and people. I know from my own process, this is regressive. So that is a major breakthrough. And that's something that I need to do repeatedly. Yeah, in order to what? Change the behavior. So how did I bring that about? By by going after the buried emotion, consciously looking for it in the body, supporting myself through different techniques to expand it, to give my brain to, so that it becomes more tolerable. The reason why it becomes more tolerable is that when I have an unbearable experience, 
emotional experience, the body typically tries to push it away. If it's successful, you don't feel it in the body. Somebody said you're dissociated, right? You're numb. But usually it can also be just distracting yourself from the situation altogether. It can be just distraction, right? It doesn't have to be, you don't have to shut down the body. You just psychologically defend against it, right? So, but when you bring it into the body, emotion is the impact a situation is having on you. Impact on your well-being. What is well-being measured by? It's measured by the state of your body, right? Whether it feels good or bad. The more I can expand, and, and typically we try to narrow it down and we feel it only when we, we have failed to completely block it from the body. You know, Sigmund or Freud said, we are all driven by the same physiology. We don't want to feel anything unpleasurable. We would prefer to feel things only that are pleasurable. Correct? That's true for you, true for me. That ensures my survival. Right? But when I have to process a difficult emotion, it, does, it comes in the way and shuts me down. So I'm lost in the past, fixated in the past. So when I, when, I, when I expand that experience to more of the body, guess what happens? It becomes more tolerable. There's a scientific explanation for that. But the simple explanation I give my clients is that if you try to lift a 50 kilo bag, right? Is it easier to lift it with just one arm or both arms? Mm -hmm. Both arms, right? It's the same principle. In fact, you can lift 75 kilos with less strain on both arms than you when then when you're lifting 50 kilos with just one arm. You're you're more at a risk of tearing your shoulders. I know that because my shoulder I have shoulder problems these days. I can feel it very quickly. So the basic principle, when I expand the emotional experience consciously in the body, I'm making sure what that it becomes more tolerable, but I'm making sure that more of my body is involved in emotion. And the science tells me that will, is the best possible situation for my brain to process the emotion and the situation to arrive at regulated cognition and behavior. So that is the basis of my work. The embodying emotion is the expansion of the expansion of, of um, conscious experience of the emotion to as many places in the body as possible. Yeah. And there are lots of ways of doing it. The techniques I've written in the book. I, when I wrote the book, I wanted the book to be written not just for psychotherapists who can reach only a limited number of people. I wanted people who are consciously doing the work on spiritual paths or on recovery paths or which are often the same right and 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 so that they can apply it to themselves they can study it together you know uh, i'm going to be doing a workbook next year on the basis of the book because the book is doing well so people can actually form study groups and practice it on their own etc cetera, etc cetera. so that's that's the whole idea so the basic technique of embodying emotion to improve behavior, you know, uh, to improve cognition and even emotional well-being is to go for the hard emotion. Not only the hard emotion, also the pleasant emotion. Some people have a difficult time feeling love. Feeling love because they're not used to it, right? So then you also can take love and expand it in your body. And it's more likely to be more durable, more durable. I just had a um, person write to me who, who's actually doing group therapy and in a difficult situation. And she said, you know, she had people not only go through a difficult experience, but she had them go through a, the positive experience that came in its wake, embody it. So what happens? It gets more imprinted. So people don't lose the good feeling as easily if they've had spent, if they spent enough time to expand the good feeling of being connected, being loved, they can take it deep into their body. Then the, the brain processes it and it gets imprinted more so that they can access it more easily. Otherwise, it's a flash in the pan. 
It can be. But very often it is the unpleasant emotion that is driving us in the direction of dysfunctional behavior. And that therefore that's very important. Yeah. So so I'm just looking. So we're looking for an emotion, right? In order to work with an emotion. Okay. <clears throat> um, there are four steps. The four steps of embodying emotions. The first step is the situation. You know, there's usually a situation that's causing the emotional difficulty, right? Or some other symptom. I'll use my example. At, after breakfast, I feel an intolerable urge to eat more, even though I'm not hungry. Right? That's the situation. And I repeatedly end up eating more than I need to. And um, so, so there is a, that's the situation. So you can imagine, uh, you can have me, uh, so you start with the situation, the seven step protocol for embodying emotion. There it is. On that page, you can go and print it out. You start with the situation. So it's a difficult situation. You know, um, um, and, 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 uh, so you ma I imagine myself at breakfast, or I can actually do it actually during breakfast tomorrow, right? <laughs> I'm in the situation. So the, the difficulty comes up at the end of the um, meal. I start to have the compulsion to eat. That's the easy way out. Then I feel so good, you know, it feels good. And only at the end, I feel empty and I feel a bit, a bit of a shame that I failed somehow to not control the behavior. So in that situation, the first step is to find an emotion, right? And as I said, if you find it hard to find a clear emotion, look for not feeling good. In that situation, how, where in the body are you feeling bad? When you don't engage in that quickly in that behavior, you know, grab a bunch of nuts and eat them mindlessly. My wife will say, you're eating those nuts mindlessly, she would say. She'll be sitting in the living room. And uh, so, so then I say, okay, I don't eat. I don't engage in it. <laughs> then I feel, might feel sad. I might feel, uh, you know, pain. But I might just feel bad. Usually, you know, this is especially useful for people who have a very low capacity for emotion or the body gets very dysregulated quickly. So it's a gentle approach. That's why I wanted to teach you this, you know. So you find an emotion, so not feeling good, and it could be just in the brain. Then what you do in the second step is expand the emotion in one place in the body. So I found it here, right? I found it here that it doesn't feel good. I said, oh, it doesn't feel good. So I might and say, can I put my hand there and expand it to more in my chest? That's step two. Find the emotion, find it in one place in the body and expand it there. Yeah. And you might try it right now. Take a situation that doesn't feel make that doesn't in which you don't feel good. Just take a small situation. And think of the situation and notice where it does not, you might find an emotion, but where it does not feel good in your body, one place. And put your hand there and expand that. So. Expand it there. 
just a little bit, not too much. You might find that it's actually more tolerable as you expand it in that area. Can be with it. And then in step three, expand that emotion in another place in the body. Yeah. So I might look for it in my belly, for example, to see how the bad feeling here, I might even put my hand here to connect the two places energetically. And I'm feeling it there. I don't know why, I'm not feeling good right now. I don't know why, but, um, but I'm putting my hand here. I'm also able to bring that feeling into my belly. And you know what? I have more control of this feeling. Of It, it fe actually feels better overall. Even though now two places are suffering as opposed to one place suffering, just the chest. Yeah. You know, I can also go on. I'm not going to do that now, but I can also uh, uh, go from the chest to my face and throat and express it in my face. Vocalization. Uh, uh, expressing. And the reason why it's very important for us to do that is because very, of, very many of us, we are suffering from very early childhood emotions that are not with words. They're with sounds. And we learn to repress them from very early on. When we do that, it blocks the emotion from the brain very effectively, research shows. So I go, uh, uh, I could have, instead of going to the belly and expanding it there like this, step three, I could have also gone up into the throat area, facial area. Yeah. Uh, 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 uh. Excuse me. You know, I was in Beijing at the beginning of, beginning of this uh, month and I picked up the, the most recent variant of COVID-19 in Beijing. I'm, I've recovered, but I'm, my body is still kind of, from time to time, I have cough and so on. So now I actually feel better. I don't know why I was feeling bad, by the way. When I, when I started, you know, it could be that I was late or, you know, I didn't get really ready, etc. I might have had, uh, you know, uh, didn't have time to shave and I had to get on the Zoom call. So all of that might might make me feel bad. Or maybe the inner critic telling me that you're not doing a good job, etc. You know, but now I don't feel bad. That's the whole idea. Whatever, whatever situation caused it, I don't feel bad. I actually feel good about the presentation now. But just expanding it what? From here to here. Yeah. I could have also expanded it there. So which means my thinking about the situation is changing, right? My thinking. But also the urge to do something to make up for what I thought was lacking is also not there. It changed my thinking as well as thing. But but in order to improve the chances of that, you know, I do it a lot, so I can get there quickly. What you do in the fourth step is that after you expand it to two places, then you pivot to integration. What is integration is the following. You're looking for improvement in the body and energy from having done the hard work in one, two, and three, steps one, two, and three. You're taking a difficult emotion. You expand it, felt it in one place in the body, you've expanded it. And the book, I give you plenty of ways of doing it, of doing the expansion, local expansion. And then we expanded it to another area, area to area expansion, plenty of ways to do that. I've shown you a simple way to do that. And then you notice how the body and the, energy have improved. And how you do that is to look for the following. I'll give you four things, concrete things. Notice whether there's an improvement in breathing. One. Two, notice whether there's an improvement in 
muscular tension. So the tension in some place is less. These are easy things for people. Most people can check. Check whether the energy is expanding somewhere in a nice way. Breath expansion, muscular expansion, energy expansion. And the four, whether the energy is more balanced in your body. So I'm going to do that now, you know. So, so I picked up an emotion, not feeling good here, expanded it here very quickly. Didn't want to stay there too long because I'm considering myself, I'm for, you know, uh, because if you stay there for too long, it might be too much for somebody who has very limited capacity for emotion. You quickly go to another place. It's like walking on snow, right? With snow, snowshoes. You don't stay in one place for too long. You sink. So you have to keep moving. That's the idea. So here in step five, I'm noticing that huh, the breathing is better. Not only is the breathing better in my chest, it's more expanded. Muscular tension is less. That's step five. I'm noticing that. And then I'm noticing where else in the body in, st in st six, where else in the body am I feeling better? Lessening of tension in my abdomen, I can feel it. And I'm, I'm just going to stay there. Maybe put my hand to support the expansion there. Feeling good there. And now I go to global integration. What is that? It's paying attention to the whole body. Mm -hmm. See how the whole body, I'm not paying attention to chest or the belly, my whole body is a muscular tension throughout my body less. It is. Yeah. But more importantly, I have energy more balanced in my body. I'm noticing that. Yeah. So I'm holding the whole body in my awareness and noticing how it becomes more energetic, <clears throat> more, less tense, how the breathing is even more throughout the body. Yeah. Yeah. And this is an important step. You know what happens? <clears throat> when diff in difficulty, my whole body closes like a clamp and pushes the universal energy out. When I open up by doing this little bit of work, right, my individual self is open to the collective. You're opening the body to the higher power more. You're never without a connection to it, but you have some control over it. So when I open my energy to the universal energy, that's where miracles take place. Yeah. It's easier to surrender to that when I have more capacity in my body for the immediate emotion I'm facing in my life. So this is the seventh step protocol. Try it, you know, try it. Uh, on my website, I actually have website videos under my book section where I actually demonstrate doing the four steps on myself, not the seven steps I perhaps need to put a seven-step protocol video there. But that's coming. But the four steps, the seven-step protocol is a particular way of doing the four steps of embodying emotions. Yeah. So, so let me stop there.